It's finally time to do an in-depth review of a game I did a half-assed job covering years ago. It's like the opposite of when Game Freak revisits their old work. I'm excited about this for a couple of reasons. One being that my original Gen 2 review is one of the worst videos I've ever made. And two, that I'm finally covering a game I actually like, and that most people also actually like, so I won't have to defend an unpopular opinion this time. Gen 2 is objectively the worst. Objectively the worst. The worst. It has terrible balance in the world design and the progression of the game. Many of the new Pokemon were exclusive to the post-game, which itself was highly lacking. They sacrificed a lot to add Kanto in, but it damaged the game. That is my view. Okay, so popular opinion seems to have shifted a tad in the past few years. People have gotten really hyperbolic about Gens 1 and 2. They're either the best games ever because childhood and everything after them was garbage because kids today have faced no attention span, or they were always garbage that have aged poorly and were never really that good to begin with because we were all dumb kids who couldn't form a critical thought. Basically, we're all becoming cranky old people who hate children. However, having spent the last couple of years really replaying and trying to understand these older Pokemon games without any kind of rose-colored glasses or resentment at Gen 1 or nostalgia, I think I understand and appreciate these games even more now as an adult than I did when I was a kid. I think there's an argument to be made for Gens 1 and 2 actually being really good Pokemon games that isn't based on their nostalgic value, and this is especially true about Gold, Silver, and Crystal. And they're not just good for their time period, they're refreshing and valuable to replay even in current day. But to explain and understand the merit of Gen 2, I think we need to look under the hood and see what its mechanics are trying to accomplish as a game in itself, rather than just comparing it to other Pokemon games. So let's start with some context. Part 1 the game Game Freak wanted to make. The year was 1990. Game Freak was finally going to get to make their beloved video game concept after playing the freelance development game for almost a decade. A small group of gaming fans who loved Dragon Quest were finally going to get to create their own epic adventure in the same vein. But theirs had a unique concept drummed up by Satoshi Tajiri about catching monsters and balls to try to bring the fun of being a kid catching bugs in the forest to a bunch of kids growing up in an increasingly urbanized Japan. One of the things that they loved about Dragon Quest was hunting down rare drops to improve their party members' equipment. And Sugimori got a drop that Tajiri needed for his party but couldn't trade. So, Tajiri saw the appeal of such a feature in an RPG, trading precious commodities with other players and working together to complete the game. And they chose the Game Boy as the platform to make use of the link cable. They had the dream, and now they had the go-ahead. But there was a catch. They had to split their time working on Gen 1 over 6 years, and develop other games for other publishers alongside it to make ends meet. They weren't working on Nintendo's dime yet, they hadn't proven themselves capable of making a hit, or had funds from previous successes to support themselves and so they had to compromise their time and attention to complete the game. It wasn't really guaranteed to be that hit that they needed. Development started in 1990 when the Game Boy was new, but by 96, interest in the platform was dwindling, and it was believed to be at the end of its lifespan. At the time, it was also conventional wisdom that RPGs just didn't have an audience outside of Japan. Pokemon's closest contemporary at the time was the Earthbound or Mother series, another RPG set in modern day and featuring children as the protagonist, but Earthbound was only a modest success and made for a home console and it was an infamous example of the problems with commercial viability in the West for the genre. And Red and Green didn't blow expectations in the first week of sales in Japan, either. It was not an overnight success, but it gained traction as 1997 wore on, and slowly built an audience in Japan. During that time, Game Freak began working on their next set of games, Pokemon Gold and Silver. The president of Nintendo at the time was pushing to go forward with the sequel almost as soon as Red and Green were finished. The decision to start on Gold and Silver was actually made absent of evidence of Pokemania. It did just well enough. Work continued on Gold and Silver, and at the Space World Expo on November 15th, 1997, Game Freak unveiled a demo to the public of a very, very early build of Gold and Silver. Just six days later at the same Space World, the president of Nintendo announced that an American localization was being produced for Pokemon Red and Blue to release the following year, joined with the release of the Pokemon anime. Pokemania was about to begin, two years into the development of Gold and Silver in September of 1998. Suddenly, Pokemon was an international phenomenon, and Game Freak had free license to not only devote all of their time and attention to one game for the first time in their career, but they had the full support of Nintendo and were urged to rework the game to be compatible with the new Game Boy Color. A far cry from the buggy, barely finished red and green, Gold and Silver were polished, carefully crafted, and meticulously thought out games, with years and years of development behind them. Red and Green are made as a part of the struggle to make what they really wanted, and Gold and Silver, it seems, might have been what they really desired from the start. The success of Pokemon allowed them to really hone in on their vision, and if any compromise was made, it was simply for space on the cart. 
They've gone on record saying that they had no plans to continue the series after Gold and Silver, but I think that might be a simplification of what was going on. The 1990s were not the most economically optimistic time in Japan, but they had peers and mentors who believed in them, even before they proved to be a success. When they looked back, they had done what they set out to do in bringing the forest to the kids of Japan, and now it was time to dream bigger. I think the mentality was, this is our chance, with gold and silver. And then at the turn of the century, when they incorporated the Pokemon Company and settled all the rights with Nintendo and Creatures, is when everyone realized that to an extent this was sustainable. The dust had settled and they had an empire. So now that we understand the fires these games were forged in, let's really get in there and take a look at what they were built to do. Part 2. Under the Hood on the surface, it's tempting to say that all Pokemon games since the beginning have followed the same basic formula, and while generally a lot of elements have stuck around for the long haul, I think fundamentally Gold, Silver, and Crystal are trying to accomplish something different than any other game in the series. To start with, the first couple Pokemon generations by themselves have a completely different formula than any game from Gen 3 onward. The narrative with the enemy team is kept minimal, legendaries were treated as extra side things that you could find and not integral to the story, and the emphasis was on a self-constructed narrative that the player gets to create as they choose to explore the region, in a somewhat non-linear way with whatever Pokémon they want by their side. And the composition of different team members was an expressive element to aid in the roleplay. How the player got around obstacles like Rock Tunnel was entirely up to them. Did they want to brute force their way through in the dark and not waste a party or move slot on something like Flash? Or did they want to go that extra mile, catch the 10 different Pokemon required to earn the HM Flash, and teach the permanent move to a party member to pass through with relative ease? These challenges and choices were the focus and made up the bulk of what's memorable and fun about Gen 1. When Gen 2 arrived, it continued in this direction, while introducing a ton of new features, and almost all of them tie into that Achilles heel clock battery. We have phone numbers, berries, daily events like Kurt crafting new balls, and radio shows to participate in, and weekly events like the SS Aqua, bug catching contests, rivalry battles, and Day of the Week siblings. These aren't just fun little optional features to make the game more immersive, they encourage a playstyle that favors small daily amounts of progress as opposed to Gen 1 or 3 which can be plowed through in a couple sittings each. Here the game expects you to put the main goal of getting badges and progressing through the game on hold every once in a while to go back and participate in these daily events. The focus seems to be on exploration in the world that the game creates, and all of these things contribute to that self-constructed narrative that has even more emphasis in this game than the last. Every day as the player finds new areas, you get to meet the people who live there. They all have names and will give you their phone numbers so that they can call and tell you about their lives. Every so often, you get to rematch them for some extra experience, and you see their teams changing and growing with time. Plans grow every day too, so stay a while. Why such a rush to move on? Those badges can wait. There's so much to do and so many people to meet in each area that you can get a full day of play in without fighting a single gym leader. Johto is this vibrant place teeming with life and experiences, and this game lets you live there. You can pick fresh berries to feed to your Pokemon, and when you find Apricorns, Kurt is never more than a small jaunt through the forest away. The region is designed in a non-linear way, in which all areas eventually connect back to one another to allow the player to go back and revisit friends and areas with ease at any time during their journey. There are multiple non-mandatory caves in the game just to encourage you to stop and explore a little before hitting up the next gym. The game wants you to play it almost like an MMO, where you complete your dailies and optimize your party bit by bit every day, especially when you consider all the cooperative elements included along with it. With Mystery Gift held mail in the trainer house, you and your friends can wind your journeys together and grow together just like the vines on the berry trees. This is what I mean when I say Gold and Silver were probably the closest thing to the team's original vision that we'll ever get. The Link Cable feature was inspired directly by Tajiri and Sugimori playing Dragon Quest 3 and wishing they could trade rare drops. Now we have a feature that exists only to provide players with the chance for rare drops if they link up. And with the amount of new trade evolutions, it's not feasible to complete this game 100% by yourself. Until Crystal, Mystery Gift was one of the only ways to get more than one of each evolutionary item, unless you felt like putting in even more work to try and snag one as a held item off a rare wild Pokemon. The connectivity this game introduced allowed you to take the experience home with you, to include your real life with your real friends in your journey. While in some games backtracking is a chore, in this game it's so free and unobstructed that moving around to different points in the region can be done from anywhere with ease. And while it certainly is encouraged, it's still only optional. You're never forced to go back and check up on Joey and his Rattata if you don't feel like it. The space here is used purposefully to make it easy and convenient to return to previous areas for daily and weekly events, not to funnel players back through an area because the region was so poorly designed that they ended up with no better way to get around. Unlike some Pokemon games, 
A good example of this is Union Cave. A ton of new rare Pokemon become available, as well as chambers in the ruins of Alf, if you take the time to come back to the area once you get Surf. But you're never told to do this. You have to just wander into it. I can't think of another Pokemon game that makes such great use of HM moves to aid in exploration. You aren't forced to come back through ever for any reason, and instead you're rewarded just for taking the time to check it out and see what new areas and items you can reach with your newfound abilities. Even the cities themselves are designed this way. Sudo Wudo could have just been replaced by an HM barrier, but instead the game wants you to take the time to figure out what to do about this weird path obstruction, go through Goldenrod and check every home and talk to every person to figure out that you need to use the squirt bottle to get through. A modern Pokemon game would never want the player to get stuck because it has different goals, a big overarching story and momentum and pace to keep in mind along with it. But in this game, it's deliberate and intentional to not only create a memorable puzzle to solve, but also to really incentivize the player to do that exploring, which is such a fundamental part of the design. All of Goldenrod is important to the game. There's not an inch wasted. There's the bike shop, there's an Eevee to find, the underground, where Team Rocket's hideout is, the radio tower, the train station, south is the daycare, north is the national park, and with all these stops to visit, the game had to throw Sudo Widow in your path just to make sure that you fully saw and tried all that there was to do, to learn the lay of the land and all that it has to offer you each day of the week. And remember that as you make progress, there's still more to discover by coming back. And only by doing that and leaving no stone unturned are you rewarded by opening up not just another new area, but another new path back through the region. This non-linearity is really only a bonus if you play this specific way, because as a result of being able to be anywhere in the game at any point, there are no trainers in the entire game aside from Red that have Pokemon higher than level 50. Which means that if you do try to plow ahead without slowly making that progress and rebattling your phone contacts, you'll be stuck in a situation where you need to grind and there won't be many Pokemon available that will be high enough level to help you catch up. So if you try to play Gen 2 the same way you play Gen 1 or 3 or 4 or 5, without doing these daily things, you'll miss out on most of the items in the game and a ton of extra experience points, ultimately making the game more frustrating. Essentially, this is the least casual, most core experience a Pokemon game has ever offered. It's the game that most resembles the RPGs that inspired it and really works as a role-playing game experience even without that much of an overarching story. Everything takes time and effort, nothing is handed to you. It wants you to take your sweet ass time and day by day chip away and make a little bit of progress, rather than jumping ahead in the game without taking time to optimize along the way. It does not support a thoughtless, unplanned team building style, and it does not support solving every problem by overleveling via grinding. Everything in this game you have to work for. Almost every wild Pokemon in the game has a chance to flee. Levels, items, legendaries, Pokemon, progress, dex data, beating red, and gym badges are all held out of your grasp. It wants you to put in the work to reach for them. I'm not going to sit here and try to argue that this game is difficult, because people get really hung up on the idea that any kid's game ever could actually be difficult. But this game does require effort, patience, and work to be put into it for a successful playthrough. It offers challenging moments and tricky situations that the player has to come up with solutions for using the Pokemon available to them. Is it hard work? A lot of the time, no, but it is work, and it rewards players who want to persevere and put in that effort. Let's back up a second though and talk about what I mean when I say that this game is the most RPG the series has ever been. Though genres are not usually useful or relevant when discussing content of a specific game, in this case I think it might be helpful to think about where this game fits in among its peers. So RPGs, they're role-playing games, and they're defined by a few specific things. Though most people tend to think of RPGs as just being any game with a typical fantasy setting, to me they're defined a lot more by how their systems facilitate storytelling and character building. The genre has its roots in tabletop and pen and paper role-playing games, where the goal is to get into character, act out scenes with your friends, and use your character's unique strengths and weaknesses to overcome challenges in the campaign. The character and their journey is the focus, but not because it's a compelling narrative thought up by the DM in isolation from your play. Rather, it's because their narrative is defined by your choices, and you interact with one another to build something compelling and immersive, to let you become another person and think about how they might handle the situation. To consider how their stats, spells, and skills allow you to do more than just running up to a monster and smacking it with your sword on your turn. It takes creativity and imagination, and in a way, is a system built to tell stories, not despite its focus on numbers and stats and roles, but because of it. The way you interpret the systems is where the magic really happens. Moving this back to a video game, the more robust and challenging the systems, the more opportunities you have to be creative, and that's why gold, silver, and crystal really shine. 
They not only have the capacity for really deep play, but they work really hard to give you all the tools you need to have a fulfilling storytelling experience. The world is developed and immersive, the Pokemon you have in your party have unique capabilities and shortcomings, and there are so many opportunities to go out of your way to do things the average player might not do, but you can make each playthrough completely unique, despite the story itself never changing. Your Pokemon start to feel like real living individuals, and the challenges you overcome together and all the things you can do with them are memorable and unique regardless of how many times you put the same species of Pokemon on your team. Think back on my rock tunnel example from earlier. These sorts of decisions are how you define your character and how you express yourself creatively. Being able to optimize your character to lean into what makes them unique and special or earn those tools for creative problem solving is what makes it worth the tedium that sometimes comes with these deeper number driven systems. That's an RPG at its purest. Pokemon is one of those weird games where it can be played a ton of different ways, and so no two people's experience with the game is likely to be the exact same. And with so many different games in the series that all offer different things, some people are going to have different things about the games that they enjoy. So of course, playing like this in this game is not going to be enjoyable to everyone. A lot of people have hard lives, and so when they come home they want to play a game to blow off steam, not work on a game that's such a project to complete. And then there are lots of people with hard lives that love a game that gives them a chance to live in another world, and put in the work to feel accomplished there and build their own story. If you're the former, this game is likely not going to be one you enjoy very much. But if you're the latter, this game offers something that not many games do anymore, a truly immersive RPG experience, and is something that due to its niche appeal is increasingly hard to find. And so a lot of things people point to as flaws are really just a result of being geared towards this playstyle and away from their specific tastes. The open-ended nature of the game may mean most endgame things are the same level, but there's really no need to grind by that point because you're also not expected to level exponentially, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. People complain that Johto is too small, but its smallness is what allows you to become intimate with it. It's what facilitates exploring and revisiting areas and becoming familiar with the setting. And what is there is gorgeous and make great use of, and taking in every sight and sound morning, noon, and night is a pleasure. Johto more than any other region gives you a chance to make it home. Gen 2 is a weird beast, because it was the point just before any thoughts of making sure the franchise was accessible and sustainable came into play. From Gen 3 onwards, they started making more of an effort to make kind of an obtuse genre more casual and easy to get into. The extra role-playing stuff stopped being integrated into the core gameplay and was treated more as side activities, and the emphasis on core play shifted towards competitive multiplayer and a more linear, story-driven single player. As the number of Pokemon games ballooned, they had to stop making as many items in Pokemon actually difficult to get in order to keep it sustainable. They had to keep younger players in mind if they wanted to replace their aging audience, and this was especially true going into Gen 3 when their first set of kids was growing out of Pokemon. So from that point on, it was really more about evolving the series and seeing where they could take it and who they could broaden its appeal to. But Gen 2 remains kind of the nerdy man's Pokemon game. It's there for the RPG fan to get lost in. So if the Gen 2 games are meant to be played in this very specific way, why do most players not do that to the point of frustration? Well, Game Freak has always been kind of bad at teaching players how their games work. Like, we didn't even have a visible way to know EVs existed until Gen 6. Part 3. Why so misunderstood? First of all, a lot of this game is geared towards putting in those daily incremental steps towards party optimization, which is something that until this point was not really necessary to complete the game. In Generation 1, for example, there is absolutely no reason to optimize your team at all unless you played competitively with the people around you. Of course, the competitive community did grow in response to the potential for optimization that was built in there, and so Nintendo held regional competitions in Japan to give players a venue for really putting these skills to the test. The demand for this was so high that eventually Game Freak developed Stadium Zero, and what we got is Stadium One to give players who couldn't attend these competitions an equal chance to test their skills. The draw to the general public was a chance to see your Pokemon in 3D, sure, but the bulk of the game is about overcoming difficult and at times downright unfair challenges to see if you really have mastered the game. The ability to raise your own teams in-game to take on these optimized computer trainers with was not only the core of what was enjoyable about the stadium games, but was also basically absolutely necessary for beating them, as the rental Pokemon were terrible. I assume this was on purpose to really drive home the idea that you should be using your raised Pokemon in these battles, but of course they couldn't charge full price for a game that requires the player to own two systems and multiple other games to play, so they had to include rentals somewhere. I think this is really the downfall of these games, because about all offerings <coughs> rentals did was just discourage players from trying to use their own Pokemon. And the way the cups were designed to be played at specific levels made planning ahead in-game to have teams ready at each level without burning all your good TMs really difficult. 
This required a degree of being able to plan ahead, or a level of knowing which glitches to abuse that appealed to a very small niche of Pokemon fans, and nonetheless proved the concept that Pokemon could be played as a core RPG. This was essentially our first Battle Frontier. So moving on to Generation 2, this time they knew from the get-go that there would most likely be a stadium game for this generation to encourage players to optimize, and in fact it was released on the very same day as Crystal in Japan. This time, breeding existed as a workaround to the needing to plan ahead that was necessary in Generation 1. Now the challenge came from being able to plan which Pokemon they would need to breed together, and how to get the optimal movesets for their teams at the optimal levels for each cup, and to prepare for that would need to go out of their way to get a hold of rare Pokemon, evolutionary, and hold items. It increased the value of rare drops exponentially, and really drove home that emphasis on cooperative play with the community in the form of Mystery Gift. The thing is that a lot of these things are so much work, even in a normal playthrough of Gold and Silver, that it seems almost anticlimactic without having the context of playing Stadium 2 to look forward to. A good half of the content, and a major incentive for putting in all that work in the first place, is walled off behind needing to own a Nintendo 64, and a game that a lot of people were just confused by and didn't think of as post-game content. Which is a shame, because playing Gold, Silver, or Crystal with the ultimate goal in mind of beating Stadium 2 just adds hundreds of hours of playtime and content to the game, and a ton of quality of life features. It lets you explore mechanics that you wouldn't even know were there otherwise. I never knew I could rename boxes in my PC or earn exclusive room decorations or that there was a move relearner in Generation 2, and the Dodrio Game Boy just makes all this breeding and leveling not nearly half the chore it could have been. So much of the Generation 2 games seem to have been built with Stadium in mind that it feels unfair to release a version on Virtual Console without re-releasing Virtual Stadium 2 alongside it. If you don't play Stadium 2, you are flat out missing half the game, and the fact that so many people don't know this is a testament to how poorly this was all telegraphed to the player. Needing to own so many games and peripherals and consoles, and on top of that not even really having the core conceit of Stadium 2 explained in a clear way at any point is a huge reason so many people see the extra work to get all those new Pokemon and items as pointless or frustrating. Which brings me to my next point. The game at no point explains why you should optimize your team or how to do it, and I'm not talking about Earl's Pokemon Academy. So the thing that's really obvious is Gold and Silver have some level scaling issues due to the emphasis on nonlinear exploration, but this shouldn't be as much of a problem as it seems to be for people, because if nothing in the game is stronger than level 50, then there's not really any reason that you need to be any higher level than that either. It's also sprinkled with daily opportunities for gaining small amounts of experience here and there, and when played as a game with these daily events, it kind of works. You can kind of get just enough extra experience along the way to stay comfortably overleveled for most of it. And where you can't be stronger level-wise than your opponent, you can outplay them. Like, I don't think the game actually expects you to bring level 80s into your fight with Red. I think it expects you to just know what you're doing enough to beat Red at a level disadvantage. And it is possible as long as you bring enough healing items or have Pokemon with recovery moves and things like that. I beat him with my Pokemon at around level 50, and I didn't even really have a good team. I just had a Clefable with Moonlight and waited until a Snorlax struggled itself to death. Not exactly an elegant solution, sure, but it did the job without forcing me to grind for several hours. I don't buy this thing I keep hearing about how anyone who picks Chikorita can never beat Red, either. If you're creative in your strategy and team building, picking a Grass-type starter at the very beginning of the game shouldn't and can't be the thing that decides your entire playthrough. I mean, it's not supposed to be ever easy to beat Red, but it's not impossible even with a huge level disadvantage. The problem, though, is that it gives you so few opportunities to learn what you're doing to outplay anybody without the advantage of levels. Basically, none of the other trainers in the game require this kind of thought and strategy to beat, or provide any sort of learning opportunity about team composition or movesets or hell items or strategy. And so players fall back on grinding because levels are the most straightforward and easy way to gauge advantage in battle. Rather than ever encouraging people to actually learn how to optimize their Pokemon's moves or make up for weaknesses with battle items, the game is breezy easy most of the way through and then just puts you in a suddenly unfair level situation and says, figure it out. And since the majority of the game doesn't teach you anything about real battling, players just do what they've always done and go back to knocking out wild Pokemon until their buddies are strong enough that they can brute force their way to victory. Most of the game doesn't require you to outplay the computer unless you run the entire thing under leveled and are constantly at a disadvantage. I guess that's a major complaint I have with Pokemon games in general, is that they have this battling system that can have a lot of depth, and Pokemon that can learn interesting combinations and moves, and a huge variety of possible party members and team combinations, but then they teach you nothing about it and never require you to get good at using it or learn how it works to beat the game. I'm not saying that they should add even more tutorials or take even more options away from the player because that's definitely the route they're going and it's not working out too well. Instead, they should 
I don't know, lead by example a bit more and have the random trainers in the game actually use Pokemon that know more than just two moves and showcase some of the different options you have for strategies, movesets, and team members. We don't need 70 trainers with the same three low-level Pokemon. We need a good chunk of the fodder trainers to actually be creatively designed so the players have a chance to learn something and actually gain real experience from battling them, not just adding numbers to their bar. I think that when people complain about needing to grind so much in Pokemon games, it's not an issue of Pokemon games being too grindy, it's just an issue of them really poorly explaining their mechanics and relying on supplementary material that a majority of players won't have access to, like third-party game guides, which, by the way, we're often wrong. Grinding in Pokemon games is almost always optional, but it's a common enough problem for players that they're starting to remove the option entirely by leveling out the challenge. And taking these opportunities for learning how to play well away actually makes it harder to learn this stuff, and places even more emphasis on grinding for levels because it leaves you with no other avenue for success. I'm saying it makes the game boring for everyone, even people who already find the games too grindy. If you can beat the entire game without once having to think about any of these things, why would you expect players to be able to beat Red's level 70s without grinding their own Pokemon up for level advantage? The main gameplay of the story mode of Pokemon games does not require the player to ever understand basic battling mechanics, and when that is the actual point and main mechanics out of Pokemon games, that's a problem. I just think that we wouldn't have quite so much of an emphasis on removing any and all challenge that might require grinding from current gen Pokemon games if they made more of an effort to teach players that there's more to winning battles than just being a higher level than your opponent. And honestly, that to me is where the game is most fun, so it's a shame that so many miss out on that. If you roleplay when you play RPGs like I do, being offered creative solutions to difficulty curves adds a lot to the experience. Relying on the level system for any and all challenge rather than just using it as a metric for character growth is boring and dumb. TLDR get good. I'm going off on a tangent here, but one of the few nice things I have to say about modern Pokemon games and difficulty is that they actually are finally starting to use some of the time spent battling randos throughout the game constructively, at least when it comes to the trail guides and totem Pokemon. They pair it with hand-holding and lots of other anti-challenge measures that create their own problems, but they've definitely evolved at least some of the way they teach players more core elements. This is also why I don't buy the experience shares a difficulty setting thing. It changes very little about the game if the game still encourages over-leveling as a means for solving every problem. Anyway, my main point is just that Pokemon games have always struggled with making their core concepts intuitive to players, and this is the biggest reason people get frustrated by mechanics like this. They don't need to be watered down to broader appeal, they just need to be demonstrated and introduced better. I personally can forgive Generation 2 for this because it was like their second game in the series, so of course they were going to have some growing pains as they introduced a more complex playstyle. It's less forgivable that they took so long to figure out ways to solve this problem, but at least Game Freak is finally getting somewhere with it. And regardless of whether or not players understood what the game was trying to accomplish, there were always going to be some that were not into what the game deep down had to offer. The Pokemon anime is what made Pokemon a success and popular here in the West, not the fact that it was an RPG. As we discussed, it being a success in spite of that was kind of a miracle given what happened to Earthbound. So those fans of the TV show picked up the trading cards and eventually the Game Boy games. More people who don't generally enjoy RPGs were suddenly playing this RPG, and so some of the more RPG things about it were going to be kind of unappealing to the general public. In recent years, they've moved towards making this less of a roadblock for new players by making it all really accessible and diluted, and with a huge focus on competitive play. So especially people who are used to the newer RPG light Pokemon games are not going to like this muddy, heavy, deep sort of playstyle. And that's okay! RPGs are, at the end of the day, just a really niche genre of games with a really niche appeal. They're not usually competitive focused, they're focused on a really deep single player experience. And in Gold and Silver's case, one with minor cooperative elements thrown in. They're really about using your imagination, taking advantage of all this rich world building that was so carefully crafted in this game to get lost in your story. If you're not used to playing games this way, or you don't find that fun in the first place, you'll just blaze through and miss out on all that stuff and then get frustrated when the game's like, whoa, slow down, kiddo. But if this is what you like, then this game offers something really special, the chance to be really immersed in the Pokemon world, not because of graphical fidelity or realism, but because the world itself is so alive and full of change and growth that you can't help but become invested in it. The chance to raise not just six, but dozens of Pokemon for many purposes, and have so many different things to do with them. 
to look back on your boxes and boxes of friends at the end of your journey and feel proud of what you've accomplished together, to have memories of overcoming tough challenges with your Pokemon, that time you barely beat Red together as you raced your dying Game Boy battery, or the time you finally found that team combination you needed to beat that stupid cheap-ass battle tower, to feel like after all that hard work you've put in to complete the Pokedex, beat Stadium 2, fill up your room with rare decorations and trophies, gone to the trouble to really take advantage of all the content this game has to offer, you've really told a story you can be proud of. Part 4. So it's perfect then. No, I wouldn't have had to put so many asterisks on my defense of its mechanics if it really had no room for improvement. But unlike some people, I can appreciate what it was trying to do and accept that even though it's not a perfect game, it's still overall a worthwhile experience. We're trying to avoid hyperbole, remember? Another example of this is how some people in the community feel about the inclusion of Kanto. Though it's treated as an expansive second region to explore, in reality it is essentially a boss rush of the Kanto gym leaders, given the dearth of content there beyond these mildly challenging battles. Daily events don't occur here at all, so the main appeal of the game and a good chunk of the things to do in it aren't carried over. It makes you not want to spend very much time there so that you can get back home and catch up with your friends and your favorite radio programs. However, this is not a game-ruining thing for me like it somehow is for some people. It's just an extra at the end of the game to give you a little more to do and explore, and a few more chances to optimize your team before Red, not a core part of the main gameplay. So it seems like a dumb thing to let ruin your entire experience. This was on the Game Boy Color in 1998. There were limitations on how much content you could pack onto a single cart. Given all the effort they already put into making you invested in your team and the world of the game, that magical moment when you take your first steps back into Kanto is an emotional and memorable one, and almost alone justifies Kanto's entire existence. People like to frame this as some big compromise, like the reason the Johto was so small was because of Kanto. And sure that's a possibility, but they make every space in Johto count. Every place is memorable and interesting, and the smallness again facilitates those daily events happening all over the map, so that you can go back and see what's new in each area every day without it being a chore to get around. The sheer size of this game, and the way they managed to make such efficient use of what little space they had in Johto to begin with, is an achievement, not just for a game on the Game Boy Color, but for game design in general. And when people complain about putting some new Pokemon in the post-game, would you rather they have left the post-game even emptier? Like, this game's whole shtick is that you gotta work for everything, and having rare Pokemon actually be hard to get is a trading incentive anyway. They're not gonna just give you a Larvitar or a Houndour, two of the best Pokemon in the entire game. At least Kanto's space is used to add to the challenge of completing the decks and earning those Alakazam killers. Nah, those things don't bother me. There are some actual minor things I do really consider flaws when taking the way the game was designed to be played into account, but they're pretty small frustrations. For example, having no alternative way to go back through Ilex Forest quickly to see Kurt every day without keeping Cut in your party was kind of a pain. I ended up breaking down and just wasting a move slot on Cut because I didn't feel like going to the PC every time I needed to go see Kurt. Another really minor thing is that you can't fly to the Indigo Plateau from New Barktown, so if you are trying to grind for levels or money using the Elite Four or something, it's just an annoying logistical thing that you gotta go all the way back to Goldenrod and take the train first before you can get back there and rechallenge them. They actually fixed this in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, by the way. Good job, guys. And why was the Rage Candy Bar not called the Cake of Rage? This is a missed opportunity. But yeah, a lot of these things can be chalked up to hardware limitations. And people tend to overblow the game's few flaws because the rest of it doesn't match their specific tastes. It's cool if this game isn't your taste, because after this, they change directions completely and work to evolve Pokemon games into something more accessible. So if this one game doesn't appeal to you, the majority of Pokemon games still should. But it's nice to have the option of having a more core experience, and refreshing to play a game that I can put 300 plus hours into and still not run out of things to do. And given that Gold and Silver just turned 20, it's remarkable that they managed to achieve this on the Game Boy Color. Part 5. Are you saying I'm playing it wrong if I don't like it? Correct.